Hello and welcome back to Golden Guns, the only YouTube channel that compares GoldenEye's legendary weapons to their real-world counterparts. By the way, if you like this video, please subscribe. It helps the channel grow and lets me know that I should keep doing these. Today we take a deep dive into my personal favorite, the legendary Walther PPK. Our story begins in 1929 with the advent of Carl Walther's police pistol. Only a year later, in 1930, Walther released the Police Pistol Criminal, or PPK for short. The word criminal in his title refers to the plainclothes detectives, the criminal division, for whom the PPK was designed. Compared to Walther's police pistol, it was slightly smaller and held one less round but they both shared a feature that made them ideal for concealed carry. The feature I'm talking about is this, right here, the decocking lever. Pulling down the lever on the gun does three important things. First, it physically blocks the hammer from striking the firing pin. Secondly, it lowers the hammer, and finally, it disables the trigger. This innovation was extremely popular with police because they would often carry with a round in the chamber, and this made it a lot safer to do so. Like many things designed in Germany before the war, the PPK also found its way into the hands of the Nazis. For this reason, it also has the rather dubious honor of being the gun that killed Adolf Hitler. In his bunker in 1945, it was his personal PPK that Hitler would reach for when he chose to end his own life. On a lighter note, it was also owned by Elvis Presley, who had engraved on his TCOB, or Taking Care of Business. Still, it was Ian Fleming's 007 who would make the police pistol criminal a household name. In his very first film, Dr. No, we see the moment Bond has issued his PPK. M disapproves of Bond's use of the Beretta 418, citing both its small caliber and nature to jam. He tells Bond, from now on, you'll carry the Walther. Walther's PPK would go on to accompany Bond for decades. In the 90s following Goldeneye, it was briefly replaced by the Walther P99. The P99, though, proved not to have the staying power, as it was replaced by the PPK again after only three films. In Rare's Goldeneye 007, we're introduced to the PPK from the moment we turn the console on. Of course, it isn't called that. Likely wanting to avoid any trademark issues, the team at Rare used pseudonyms to refer to each gun. In this case, the PP7 is obviously supposed to represent the Walther PPK. That being the case, I'll refer to the PP7 as the PPK from here on out. After playing games where you spend an hour doing tutorials just wondering when you're going to get a gun, it's refreshing to see that as the camera circles around Bond, the PPK comes into view and we're set free to experience the game on our own. You'll find the PPK accompanies Bond on almost every level of the game. Mishkin must have liked it so much that he just left it there on the table for Bond to look at. I'll never understand that move. Based on the nature of the mission, we get to use the PPK in both its suppressed and unsuppressed configuration. I do want to be clear though, I use the word suppressed, not silent. It's not like in the movies. A suppressor doesn't really silence the gun, it just makes it not as deafening. Now, in Goldeneye, if the suppressor is supposed to make Bond's actions more stealthy, it does seem to be used or emitted somewhat strangely. On the frigate, for example, a mission where we're tasked with releasing hostages, one would imagine stealth would be of the essence. Yet, there we are, entering this delicate operation with an unsuppressed PPK. In contrast, Silo, a mission where stealth seems to go right out the window, we have the suppressor. Having said that, it isn't entirely random. On most outdoor levels, the suppressor is omitted, while being fitted on most indoor levels. Control center and surface, however, seem to be exceptions to this. Nitpicking aside, I like that the designers offered this subtle but regular variety. Though I think you'd be hard pressed to call anything about Goldeneye monotonous, using the PPK in two different configurations does help to keep things feeling fresh. 
In a perfect world, we would be able to equip or unequip the suppressor with a button press, but this was not commonly seen in 1997, so it's certainly nothing to complain about. Let's take a look now at the ammunition used in Bond's PPK. The original Walther PPK was chambered in 32 ACP, but it's also been offered in 38 and 22 caliber as well. Now, 32 Auto is far from the largest caliber. 9mm is preferred by most for its superior stopping power, but it would simply be too powerful for the PPK's small frame. Because its size is part of the PPK's selling point, 32, 38, and 22 are all suitable compromises. In game, Bond's PPK is shown to take the same ammo as the DD44 and various submachine guns such as the Klob and DK5. This is technically incorrect, but for the purpose of game design, it makes sense. A huge part of the appeal to Goldeneye is its large selection of weapons. The game would have been a lot less enjoyable if players were forced to run all over the map to find each individual caliber. Perhaps each crate contains multiple types of ammunition, or perhaps I'm reading too much into this. Now that we've looked at its 64-bit brethren, let's turn our attention to the real-world PPK. This is my Walther PPKS. The S variant is almost identical to the PPK, with only minor revisions to keep it in line with American import requirements. The Walther PPK features a single-stack magazine that holds 7 rounds of 380, 8 rounds of 32 auto, or 10 rounds of 22. As far as the actual function of the PPK, there isn't a lot to say. It's great! The design is well respected because, well, it works. When choosing a concealed carry pistol, the most important factor is reliability. The bottom line is it needs to go bang and hit the target every time. You can see why this was a hit with police forces and copied around the world. Speaking of copies, there were a lot. The Soviet Makarov, which is used by Omarov, by the way, and the Polish P64. I also happen to have this Czechoslovakian CZ-50. Being a PP copy, the CZ-50 is a tiny bit larger and heavier than my PPK, and the slightly heavier frame does a very nice job of managing the recoil. While I like the CZ, I have to say that overall the fit and finish just doesn't compare to the Walther. Having said that, it's not a bad copy, and for the money, I actually would recommend it. So how's the PPK for accuracy? Well, it's fine. With the short barrel of the PPK, you shouldn't expect to pick off any targets from a distance, but that's not what it's intended for. It's a close quarters weapon, and for self-defense, it's perfect. So how about the stopping power? Again, it's fine. It's not the most powerful gun on the market, but it doesn't need to be. The whole point of this design is to be easy to carry and reliable in a pinch, and in those areas, it excels. So this is the part of the video where I usually would say, should you own one? And then say something like, well, it depends. But in this case, if you're a gun guy and you don't own one, uh, what are you doing? Just go buy one. But in all seriousness, the PPK is a classic. If you're thinking about getting one, I'd highly recommend it. It's rugged, reliable, practical, a great choice for self-defense. What more do I need to say? And indeed, what else can be said about this legend of a gun? Whether you know it as the PPK or the PP7, whether you first saw it in the hands of Sean Connery or Pierce Brosnan, it's a classic through and through. The one, the only, Walther PPK.